Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get Dad for Father's Day? Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1 and save 15% off your order when you check out Row 1 Brand's Vintage Sports Pictorium Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for Dad this Father's Day. If he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 Vintage NFL Helmet Poster. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row1. He had an imposing physique that earned him nicknames such as Paul Bunyan, Mr. America, Muscles. Over the course of 10 years, he averaged almost 25 home runs a season. He was Mr. Downstairs to Harmon Killebrew's Mr. Upstairs. Three times, he was an all-star, and he was named the American League's Rookie of the Year in 1959. Yet, outside of Minnesota... Very few, if any, have ever heard or remember the name Bob Allison. And next, on Sports Forgotten Heroes, we're going to take a look back at a most unheralded but fantastic career of one of the Minnesota Twins' all-time greats, Bob Allison. This is Sports Forgotten Heroes, a tribute to the stars who shape the games we love to watch and the games we love to play. Stars who provided us with many thrills, but when their time was up, they faded away. We'll take a look back at their spectacular careers, their moments of fame, even if it was just for one season or just one game. And now, here's your host, Warren Rogan. Hello once again and welcome to Sports Forgotten Heroes and our Summer of Baseball. You know, as the Open to the Podcast says, Sports Forgotten Heroes isn't about the greatest players who have ever played the game in their respective sports. This podcast is about the guys who were great, but for whatever reason their careers have been forgotten. Sometimes it's just a clear case of them being overshadowed by another superstar on their team. The stars we talk about might have had a great career, one great season, or even one great game. And today, we're going to talk about a guy who had a solid career, a great career, was a leader on his team, averaged almost 25 home runs a year for the Minnesota Twins, but was somewhat overshadowed by one of the Twins' most popular players ever, Harmon Killebrew. Today, we're going to talk about Bob Allison, and joining me in just a moment to do so, once again, is Gregory H. Wolf, the director of the Bio Project for Sabre. Gregory has written more than 150 biographies for the Bio Project, including a biography on today's topic, Bob Allison, and he's authored such books as A Pennant for the Twin Cities and Winning on the North Side, the 1929 Chicago Cubs. First, as always, just a few quick reminders. This episode of Sports Forgotten Heroes is sponsored by Audible. With Audible, you get a free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. Every week, I let all of you know about Audible. It really is a terrific way to get your reading in. And if you sign up for a free 30-day trial, you get a free download. And Audible sends Sports Forgotten Heroes a little something to keep this podcast going. Some of the titles you might be interested in are Roger Kahn's classic, The Boys of Summer, The Big Bam, The Life and Times of Babe Ruth, or Dynastic Bombastic Fantastic, a look back at the Oakland A's of the 1970s. There's close to 200,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Give Audible a try free at www.audibletrial.com backslash sportsfh. Check out our page on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at SportsFHeroes. Check out SportsFH.com where you can see what's coming up on Sports Forgotten Heroes. Read more about our guests. You can leave us comments, suggest topics for upcoming episodes, or send in questions. And if you think about it, please leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts. So, Bob Allison, as I mentioned earlier, He averaged almost 25 home runs a season. In fact, 
When you calculate what he did over a 162-game season, Bob's average jumps to 27 home runs a year and 84 RBI a season. Now, maybe those aren't the huge numbers we're impressed by today, but back in the 1960s, those were terrific numbers. Several wrist injuries ultimately robbed Bob of more power and an elongated career. In reality, he really only played nine full seasons, but over the course of those seasons, Bob was voted the American League's Rookie of the Year and was named an All-Star three times. His defense, well, that was quite spectacular, too. In fact, if you want to see one of his greatest catches, visit SportsFH.com, where I have a link to a spectacular catch of his in the 1965 World Series against the Los Angeles Dodgers. The story of Bob Allison covers so much of what baseball has evolved to today. He signed with the then Washington Senators during the period of the bonus baby. Now this was prior to baseball having an entry draft and he was also on a team that finally ended the New York Yankees dominance of the 1960s. He played for the Twins prior to baseball's big expansion and he helped bring baseball, exciting baseball, to the upper Midwest. And here to talk more about one of the all-time heroes of the Minnesota Twins, and a baseball player whose career is forgotten and really shouldn't be. We're talking about Bob Allison. Joining us now to talk about Bob is Gregory H. Wolf. Gregory, thanks once again for joining me on Sports Forgotten Heroes. I'm so glad you're back. Well, Warren, I really appreciate the invitation. It's uh, an honor to be with you and to speak about uh, Bob Allison today. Yeah, quite quite an interesting uh, baseball player. But before we get there, you've written books about baseball. So many bios for Sabre's bio project. How do you decide on who to write about? And then how did you settle on writing about Bob Allison? Oh, well, uh, I am the co-director of Sabre's biography project. That is a an effort that was founded by Mark Armour about 15 years ago and Silver, the Society for American Baseball Research. Um, the bio project has a goal of writing an in-depth uh, academic biography of every player who ever played baseball. These biographies tend to be around 4,000 to maybe 6,000 words, some a little bit shorter, obviously, but 4,000 words to give you an idea is around 15 pages plus your footnotes and your and your uh, bibliography. Wow. And I've written about uh, 150, maybe a little bit more now, and have written uh, eight books for Sabre as well. And one of the books that I did for Sabre uh, is called uh, Pennant for the Twin Cities, about the Twins 1965 pennant uh, season. What a great and year that was. It was. And um, that team has always fascinated me. Uh, the Twins, I, I've always been enamored with the baseball cap. Um, and I think a lot, of, a lot of times when we think of the Twins of the 1960s, a lot of names will pop up. Um, maybe first and foremost, you think of Harmon Killebrew, the Hall of Fame slugger. Sure. If you don't think of him, maybe you think of uh, Tony Oliva, mm-hmm. uh, Rookie of the Year 1964. He won the batting title in 64 and 65. And of course, his career was prematurely ended because of knee injuries. If you don't think of Killebrew or, or Oliva, maybe you think of the 1965 MVP, the American League MVP. He was on the Twins. That was Zoilo Versalles, also a, from Cuba. Or maybe you think of Jim Cott. Mm-hmm. Current Gold Glove winner. I argue he, he should be a, a, a Hall of Famer. Hmm. Maybe another pitcher, Camilo Pasquale, another Cuban. He probably had the best curveball of his generation. And if you think of the Twins in general, the 1960s, obviously uh, you're going to think of Rod Carew. He was the 67 Rookie of the Year. So we've just named um, six or seven players, all of whom won hardware 
for the twins in the 1960s. The name that I did not mention is the one about whom I want to speak, and that is Bob Allison. Sure. Now, Bob Allison um, is, I think, an interesting figure. Um, I'm not one of these people who like to compare players to other players or make a case that one player is better or one player is worse uh, than another. But I think that because of the, the stars on the, on the Twins in the 1960s, Bob Allison is overlooked. If you talk, however, to Twins players of the 1960s, Bob Allison is definitely not overlooked. Now, one of the Twins' longtime um, beat reporters, Arno Gothel, called Bob Allison the unknown outfielder. But he was unknown to the Minnesota Twins fans of the 1960s, definitely not unknown to the opposition. Now, when you think of Bob Allison, you're talking about a person who was big. He was about 6'3", 210 pounds. And in many ways, um, he had everything you wanted in a ball player. He was fast, not traditionally fast, like, let's say, Mickey Mantle was fast. Mm -hmm. He stole bases and was a daring base runner, but not a traditional base stealer, let's say, like Luis Aparicio in the American League. He was a versatile outfielder who played all three positions and later on first base. He had a powerful arm. He was a feared slugger. I think one of the most overlooked sluggers of the 1960s, and uh, you know as well as I do, that was really a depressed uh, offensive era. But he but, he could he could really whack the ball. Um, he, uh, he really could. But above all, uh, Warren, what I'd like to concentrate on with Bob Allison today is Bob Allison was a team leader. He was a vocal leader on a team that was known for quiet types. Hmm. Harmon Crew wasn't a rah-rah type. Nor was Zoilo Versales and Rod Carew, of course, the Latino players uh, speaking Spanish as a native language, typically were not the rah-rah players of that era. Mm -hmm. But Bob Allison was a vocal leader. He was competitive. He led by example. And he was liked by his teammates and loved by the fans. Really interesting. Let, let me ask, be, I, I, sometimes I ask this at the end of an interview, but I'm going to ask this in the beginning of, of today's. What surprised you most about Bob? What did you find out about Bob that you didn't know and, and you were like, wow, that's really interesting? Well, I, for a lot of people, if you just... Look at the look on the back of baseball cards, or at least my era looking on the back of baseball cards 30 and 40 uh, years ago, or today you're looking at baseballreference.com. Bob Allison's career cannot simply be summed up by uh, the, uh, the accumulated statistics. He only played nine full seasons, and I'm calling a full season with over 500 plate appearances. Okay. He played four parts of four seasons, a call-up, September call-up um, in 1958. And his last two seasons were really injury-prone. Uh, and uh, in the end, you're talking about a player who only played nine full seasons. He had 256 home runs and 796 RBIs. Those numbers, those aren't going to catch the attention of a lot of kids or a lot of adults who are looking at baseball reference, cumulative statistics. But the importance of Bob Allison go well beyond that. And if you take a look at his statistics within the context of the 1960s, um, in the context of baseball's emerging and changing demographics of the late 1950s and 1960s, you can see that Bob Allison is important. And that was going to be a question or maybe a remark that I had for you Maybe somebody would say, why should we even care about Bob Allison yep. if, in fact, he only played nine full seasons and you're talking about 250 home runs and almost 800 RBIs? But in the end, Warren, 
those numbers are about the same numbers that Roger Maris had. Hmm. But of course, Roger Maris had that spectacular season in 1961, uh, the 61 home runs. Sure. And he was MVP the season prior to that with 39 home runs. So Bob Allison is maybe a player who's overlooked because of this star-studded cast that the Minnesota Twins had. And after all, um, that wasn't an expansion team, but I'd like to go, I'll, I'll go into that. Sure. Maybe we're going to, we're, yeah, we're going to get there. Let me, let me ask you also what, one other thing before we really dive deep into Bob Allison, I'd like to ask you this, how difficult was it to play in the shadow of one of Minnesota's all time greats? And you mentioned his name before Harmon Killebrew. Well, I don't think that it was necessarily uh, difficult for Bob Allison. Um, I mean, I don't know. Of course, Bob Allison, uh, he, is, he died um, uh, well, almost 25 years ago in 1995. Right. And I, I never found an interview with him, quite honestly, or any report about him uh, playing in, in Harmon Killebrew's shadow. But I will say that uh, Bob Allison and Harmon Killebrew were very, very close friends. And that's uh, something that I would like to talk about, how they came up together, mm -hmm. albeit with radically different paths. Sure. And, I, and, I've, and I've got questions like that written down. In fact, you know, yeah, I, I, I am going to ask you to talk about their friendship and how close they were. How much did it affect Bob Allison's notoriety, his popularity, based on the fact that he played in Minnesota. And of course, this is before we had cable TV, before you mm -hmm. could be streaming games on, on Facebook, which they do now. How, yes, how, much, how much did it affect his notoriety had he played in Chicago or New York or for one of the teams out in California? How much was his notoriety affected by the fact that not only did he play in Minnesota, as you just said, it, Minnesota was not an expansion team, but it was in really new territory, uh, mm -hmm. having moved there from Washington, new territory, and again, no, you know, no cable, no streaming services, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. how, how much was his notoriety affected? Well, I, I think that was that's that's the key. Um, the attention on that club throughout the 1960s was the prodigious power of Harmon Killebrew, and that garnered the national attention. And when we think of the 1960s, the first half of the 1960s, 1960 through 1964, uh, New York Yankees won those five consecutive pennants in the American League. Um, they were challenged by the Minnesota Twins um, in 1962, and of course the Twins won in 1965. But Bob Allison, in 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 all purposes, was an afterthought for any national media um, for the Minnesota Twins, and and that I think definitely clouded his name recognition outside of uh, the Twin Cities. Sure. Absolutely. Give us a little more background on Bob. Who was well, he and, and just how good an athlete was he? I mean, he had a football scholarship at, at Kansas. There were several mm -hmm. pro teams that showed interest in him. Um, why did he pick baseball over football? Talk about the athlete that he was. Well, he's, um, he's from... Um, outside of Kansas City in a small town called Raytown. It's east of Kansas City. He was born during the Depression. He learned baseball from his father, Jim, who was a semi-pro player. And growing up, um, like uh, kids all uh, of his era and of his age and area, he played all sports in high school, football, track, um, and basketball. His high school did not have a baseball team, which was not uh, – which was not abnormal at the time, mm -hmm. but Kansas, the Kansas City area has very good baseball. Uh, it's a hotbed for baseball, and he was um, a very um, well-respected player in the in the very highly competitive Ben Johnson baseball leagues. And the Ben the Ben Johnson league 
um, in and around uh, Kansas City on the Missouri side um, attracted scouts from all over uh, the U.S., uh, baseball scouts. Now, I, I don't mean just from, at the time, the 16 uh, Major League Baseball teams. We were also talking about PCL teams that, that uh, were independent, of course, as sure. you know, AAA and even elevated to the unclassified um, category in the 1950s. But they had the scouts were crawling all over the Ben Johnson League. Now, uh, 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 Allison graduated in 1952, and as I mentioned, as you mentioned, he took uh, accepted a football scholarship to go to Kansas. Now, given his size, about 6'3", 210 pounds, had football, had professional football been what it became even 10 years later, when we think of after Johnny Unitas's uh, epic performance in the national ch- in, in a, uh, NFL championship game at the end of the 1950s, mm-hmm. um, Bob Allison, I think, could have been an amazing pro football player, a fullback who would have been like Larry Zonka. Um, you wow. remember Larry Zonka. Wow. That could be a good story for one of your programs. Um, or a Franco Harris. Um, along these lines, Leroy Kelly, he was fast, he was big. And he was rugged. Now, he played football for two years, 52 and 53, his freshman and sophomore year. And he went out for baseball his sophomore year, 1954, only played one season. And in, in, um, now he lost his academic scholarship, his sports scholarship, because of his academics hmm. at the end of the sophomore year. But by that time, by 1954, he had been on baseball scouts radar for two years. Now, he was scouted, like you mentioned by a number of baseball teams. Uh, the Yankees were really hot on his trail. That was Tom Greenway, the very well-known baseball scout, who also signed, uh, of course, Mickey Mantle. He was the, the, the White Sox, the St. Louis Cardinals, of course, nearby were, were on his, um, on his uh, watch, the Milwaukee Braves, the Giants, uh, but also Washington. Now, there are some interesting stories about why he would have chosen a team like Washington. Um, the Senators, with their um, well-known uh, saying, first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League, that's Washington. <laughs> Tom Greenway, of course, tried to persuade uh, Bob Allison to join the very long and deep farm and chain gang um, that the New York Yankees had. But the scout for the Washington Senators at the time who was scouting Bob Allison, his name was Ray Baker. Ray Baker said, you know, if you go to the Yankees, you're not going to play. You might be on their on their farm system for five or six years. You'll be lucky to make it up by the end of the decade. And he was right. And so um, Allison wanted to play ball. And he signed with the Washington, Washington Senators. Now, to the Senators, we just noted that funny epithet about how bad they were. And as you know, they really had maybe a decade of success between 1924 and 1933 when they won three pennants, the first two with Walter Johnson pitching and the, and the, and the latter one with him as the manager. But that was a sorry team, uh, just like the St. Louis Browns. Mm-hmm. And the best thing that happened uh, to Bob Allison is, in fact, that he signed with the Washington Senators, and maybe even more important is the bonus that he accepted. He accepted a $4,000 bonus. Now, why is that important? Under the uh, the baby, the, the bonus baby rules of the time, if you accepted over a $4,000 bonus, a major league team was obliged to keep that player on its roster for the first two years. And that really impeded the development of a player. Now, we think of Sandy Koufax, of course. Maybe that's the best example. And and um, also, at a point of clarification, that also affected Harmon Killebrew because I think exactly. he was a bonus baby, and he had to stay up with Washington. And just a couple other points here and a question for you. For our listeners, there were two versions of the Washington Senators. Now, Bob played for the first version that ultimately moved to Minnesota. Then the Washington Senators were 
I guess, resurrected, became the Texas Rangers. And now, of course, you have the Washington Nationals. Now, you're also talking Mm -hmm. about Bob being able to pick the team that he wanted to go to. So at that time, there was no baseball draft, correct? Correct. The baseball draft didn't start until 1965. In essence, everybody was a free agent. All players, high school players, there were some college players, but mainly um, kids signed uh, when they were finishing high school. There was a um, rules changed, of course, over the course of the 1940s and 1950s, and players had to be 18 years old to sign. Of course, there were a lot of um, some shady dealings, too. Hmm. He could sign with whichever team he wanted and chose the Washington Senators, and that's the first incarnation of the Senators. Uh, for Major League Baseball, Um, and he signed with them. And as I mentioned, it was really important that he signed for $4,000 bonus, which did not make him a bonus baby. And you rightly mentioned Harmon Killebrew. Harmon Killebrew signed in 1954 for about $30,000, and he was obliged to stay on the roster of the Washington Senators for both 1954 in 1955, as an 18 and 19-year-old, and he only had about 100 at-bats, had four home runs in those two seasons. Now, obviously, an 18-year-old player um, has no business playing Major League Ball. Keep right. in mind, with just 16 teams and eight, in the, eight teams in the American League, you're talking about just a handful of players. Um, and, of course, that means baseball players were older. Right. And, I, I, this this comparison with uh, Killebrew is one. This friendship and comparison, it really holds true. They um, those two players, their careers will 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 follow one another. Now, uh, Allison was immediately uh, assigned to a Class B league in 1955. That was the Piedmont League, and then in 1956. Um, in 1956, uh, he goes to Charlotte. Now, that's the Class A League. Now, why that's um, that's important for us is because of uh, gradually getting to know Harmon Killebrew um, in, uh, in, in, in Charlotte. Because Harmon Killebrew, after spending two years in the major leagues, is sent to Charlotte in 1956. He's, he's allowed to be assigned to the minor leagues, and that's where they begin to meet each other in 1956. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Bob Allison, we mentioned how big he was. We mentioned his slugging potential. This was There was no indication in his early career at all that he would emerge as a slugger. He was a big, rugged person who was, quite honestly, not an especially good hitter. Um, he slugged just over 300 as a as in his first year pro ball and in Charlotte um, in 1956 um, he slugged just 400 so there was real no indication now in 57 both he and Killebrew are moved up a notch to double A to Chattanooga uh, that's the Chattanooga Lookouts and the Southern Association and I think this is a pivotal year in both of their careers. Mm-hmm. Um, Killebrew, in many ways, was still trying to find his footing in, in, in 1956 with Charlotte. Killebrew winds up leading the Southern Association in home runs in 1957 with 29. And Bob Allison, he's moved up with him, as I mentioned. Allison only has two home runs. In many ways, uh, a lot of scouts had no belief that he would ever make it to the major leagues. Right. So, so let me ask, let me ask you something here. We're, we're going through, through, through the, uh, his, his minor league career, and I'm sure you're going to get here and you, you've discussed, uh, you've touched upon the fact that he hit over 200 home runs in the majors. Um, he didn't show a lot of power in the minors. I think the most home runs he hit in a season was 12 for Charlotte, the single A team. Then he breaks through 
and clubs 30 home runs for the Senators in his rookie year of 1959. What mm-hmm. gives? Well, um, he had there was a he had a September call up the year before him in 1958. Um, had a handful of hits, batted 200, one extra base hit. Um, so he's back at spring training in 1959, and that season, as you rightly mentioned. Rookie of the Year in 1959, the American League Rookie of the Year, it really does defy all expectations. Now, in his four years of the minor leagues, he hit a combined 28 home runs in four years Mm -hmm. of the minors, and he did not play triple-A ball. He went from B to A, spent two years in double-A with Chattanooga in the um, Southern Association. Now, in spring training, what captures everyone's attention are the three S's, his side, speed, and strength. Mm. The the trainer for the Washington Senators calls him the strongest man he's ever attended to. Kelvin Griffith, the owner of the team, he lauds and praises his arm strength. The sports writers, on the other hand, the people who really see what's going on in spring training and have perhaps some context previous years, they're flabbergasted that he's even in spring training. Right. Shirley Povich said said he's not he's not a power hitter. And I think the manager at the time, and you wrote about this, Cookie Lavagetto, said he was the worst you ever saw at the plate. He chopped yep. at the ball like he had an axe in his hand. Yeah, he, he chopped and he lunged at the ball. Uh the Bob Bob Eighty, the beat writer, um, uh, uh, basically summed it up like the other sports reporters at the time. Um, they didn't think that he would even last through the end of spring training. But um, he got into some good company his first year. And I don't want to say that this is the reason that his batting stance changed. And I don't want to say it's the reason for his success. Um, and it is a player by the name of Roy Seavers. Mm-hmm. Now, I also wrote a biography of Roy Seavers and um, had the privilege of interviewing him on several occasions for that biography. And I think he died about two years ago. Now, Roy Seavers came up with the St. Louis Browns. He's from St. Louis, went to Beaumont High School, the former Beaumont High School, which was located not that far from Sportsman's Park. Mm -hmm. Roy Seavers was not considered a home run hitter, was not considered a slugger. He was a line drive hitter. But Roy Seavers developed and made himself into a slugger, and he wound up leading the American League in home runs and RBIs in 1957 for a last-place team, the first, let me add, player in in American League history to lead the American League in both of those categories for a a last-place team. Wow. Receivers, I asked receivers about uh, about his discussions with, um, with Bob Allison, now, Roy Seavers, um, in many ways, was yeah, as an older uh, uh, senior player, a mature player, gave this youngster some advice. And some of the advice was move closer to the plate and don't lunge for the ball or don't lunge at the ball. Now, those, of course, are probably pieces of advice that Bob Allison heard his whole life, right? Sure. It's definitely not the first time that he heard it. But it's definitely the first time that he heard it from someone who's not just an American League former AL home run champ, but Roy Seavers had one of the most graceful swings in baseball history. He had a textbook swing. Now, these two things, I'll argue, really made the difference in Bob Allison's career. But there's maybe one more thing that we can never overlook. You know as well as I do that... Well, baseball is more than just raw talent. Yes. Baseball is a desire. Baseball is a willingness to to look at where your weaknesses are and find a way to improve those weaknesses. It's studying. That's looking at um, where you're, where, where, uh, how pitchers are throwing to you. It's about studying. Now, granted, the, the idea of working with a film was not it wasn't non-existent. There were players even in the 1950s who were already studying film of themselves, and one of the first to do that was Ted Glazuski, by the way. Mm-hmm. But 
were looking at film, but they were discussing players among themselves. How are pitchers throwing and where are their weaknesses? Now, Bob Allison had a work ethic, which was monumental for the team. Now, the question is, where is he going to play in 1959? He makes the team. In many ways, it was a surprise. And you mentioned that quote by Cookie Lavagetto himself, um, a, a great baseball player whose career in many ways was ended by World War II. Um, he never came back from, he only played in a few games after being uh, abroad uh, in, in the services for four years. Now, in 1959, to show you how versatile Bob Allison was, Within 12 games of the season, he had played already right field, left field, and by the 12th game of the, of the season, he settled in at the, as the center fielder. Hmm. We're talking about somebody who's 6'3", 210, built like a running back or a linebacker at the time. Who had nicknames <laughs> like Paul Bunyan and Mr. America and yeah. Muscles. I mean, this guy had a physical appearance that was just unlike anything else in baseball at the time. You're right. You're right. Now, the center fielder for the, for the Washington Senators at the time in 1958 was the reigning AL Rookie of the Year, Albie Pearson. <laughs> he was somebody about whom the sports cast or the sports writers thought would not even make the team by the 12th game of the season in his rookie year, he displaces the reigning rookie of the year who was ultimately traded that season. <laughs> by the end of, by the end of July, by the end of July, now we're talking April, May, June, July, um, not quite four months, three and a half months. Bob Allison hit 27 home runs. And, an and, and here we go. So, and he gets to the all-star game. So as we're talking about his rookie year, I believe being an all-star is a huge part of it. And at the time there were two all-star games played each year. So mm -hmm. yes, continue talking about Bob's rookie year and just how darned good he was. And then I'd actually like for you to touch upon a little bit about baseball history and tell us why there were two all-star games a year, and then why did baseball stop this? Well, there's a lot of reasons for um, why there were two. Um, the biggest reason was because of the financial successes of the all-star game. That was the biggest reason to have these multiple all-star games in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And they typically took place like the All-Star Game does now, um, early uh, July, mid-July, and then the second game took place at the end of July. However, despite the, the fight, what, what was thought to be a financial boon of the All-Star Game, turned out to, to backfire that the, that the second game was not quite as successful. It was not quite of a special um, special game with a lot of, um, uh, let's say, pageantry and ceremony to it. And the players especially did not like the second game yeah. uh, because of, because of um, the travel required, because of breaking up the season at that time, being away from the team, wanting to play, wanting some free time. Um, and when we think of uh, the games, it's not as if the games had two sets of players. Typically, if you if you were to look at uh, the stars at the time, the big name stars are playing in both of these games, so it is mm. a demand on these players. Now, some players, of course, were not selected to both games. Bob Allison is a good example of that, and he went to the second game, and by the end of the month of uh, in July, when the uh, when the game was uh, taking place. Um, a right among the leaders in home runs with 27 home runs. Now he only finished with 30. He had a big, he had a slump the last two, two uh, months of the slump uh, of the season. He slumped, but that in no way diminishes what he did mm -hmm. um, to really tell you uh, we've mentioned the size. He led the American league in triples was 30. Uh, he was wow. fifth in stolen bases with 13. Of course, that doesn't sound like a big number, but you're talking about an era when, teams eschewed stolen bases right and he was the rookie of the year 
And um, I think um, if people are, are interested in numbers and things like that, um, the Washington Senators had a trio of 30 plus home run sluggers. Killebrew belted 42. And as, as we mentioned, um, Allison belted 30. And Jim Lemon, who was a tall six foot four slugger, another overlooked slugger who came into his own in the late 1950s, he had 33. And these are uh, to have three, to have a trio of hitters in the same team with 30 plus home runs was really a, a novelty. Uh, that was the first time it had been done since 41 with the Yankees, the Maggio, or Charlie Keller and Tommy Heinrich did it. And uh, just the seventh time in baseball history. So that was a big thing. Sure. Sure. So, so he, he, he really makes his mark obviously in 1959 winning the rookie of the year. And this is after spending, you know, all those years in the minors and then getting a cup of coffee, the proverbial cup of coffee with the senators mm-hmm. in 1958. But after the 1958 season, he was, uh, uh, he went on to Cuba and he played ball in Cuba in the winter of 1958. How important was that season for him or that winter for him in 1958? And what was going on in Cuba at that time? Uh, well, it's uh, two good points. And I, I think I wrote about that in my bi- biography of Allison. Um, one, uh, playing winter ball was very important for uh, prospective major leaguers, um, even developed major leaguers. Um, of course, many, many minor leaguers. One, it was extra income. It was a way for perhaps players on a big league roster to get additional um, at-bats or innings uh, if you're on the pitching staff. So it was very important. We think of not just Cuba, but especially Puerto Rico and Venezuela for the winter leagues, very important. But of course, in Cuba at the time, uh, we think of uh, the front seat of the Cuban revolution that he that uh, Bob Allison is seeing. <laughs> What a what a thing to see! Well, it it definitely was. I can only imagine. I have um, I've read a lot of accounts of baseball players who were in Cuba during uh, during uh, the winter baseball season uh, and seeing um, uh, Castro's uh, revolutionary army in uh, with uh, machine guns and Kalashnikovs or whatever weapons they might have had at the time in uh, in the stadiums. In uh, in Havana, in the stadium in Havana, for example. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a good point that you brought up, because um, to say that just one player like Roy Sievers is the reason to have uh, the success in, in 1959, of course, um, is way blown out of proportion. Um, Bob Allison played baseball nonstop for basically two years. That ability. Uh, to have uh, additional at bats and work with a lot of coaches, that's really what made him uh, a great player uh, and the willingness to uh, to improve himself. So, uh, how much how much did his strength contribute to his game? I mean, I, I guess it's sort of a rhetorical question, but like I said, he had these crazy nicknames because of just his physical stature. How strong how strong was he, and how much? Did did I guess filling out contribute to his success? Well, I think uh, it uh, did in many ways. One, um, Bob Allison was not this gigantic, muscular man who hit home runs like Mark McGuire did. Okay, uh, Bob Allison was not this extreme long ball hitter. In fact, he was a laser line drive hitter. Mm -hmm. Um, When we think of long home runs, that was Harmon Killebrew. Harmon Killebrew's nickname was Mr. Upstairs, and Allison's nickname was Mr. Downstairs. Right. He would hit a laser, a bullet that would go careening. (laughs) Sometimes when I I live here in Chicago, and when I see Cobb or Schwarber, hit some of his laser beam home runs that look like they're only 30 feet 
over um, you know, over the over the over the grass. Those are the kinds of home runs that Allison hit. Uh huh. His um nicknames, Mister you know, Paul Bunyan and Mister Muscles, and his Herculean physique. Maybe I should. Maybe we should gradually move over to uh, the move to Minnesota. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So, so the Senators moved to Minnesota. Um, uh, uh, they were the Washington Senators, and after the 1960 season, they moved to Minnesota. Tell us about the Senator teams he played for and Calvin Griffith, the team's owner, and and why the Senators ultimately moved to Minnesota, how they found or chose to play in Minnesota, and how that ended up being a better place to play than our nation's capital. Yeah, well, all of those are good questions, and I I really um, I'm fascinated by um the changes that baseball experienced in the 1950s. So let's maybe I'll start with the owner of the Washington Senators, uh, Calvin Griffith. Now, Calvin Griffith was the adopted son of the original owner and founder, uh, the original owner of the Washington Senators, whose name was Clark Griffith. When Clark Griffith died in 1955, Calvin Griffin, Calvin Griffith took over the team. Um, not a lot, basically, as soon as he took over the team, he had begun to explore options to relocate the team. Now, the question might be, where would he relocate the team? Actually, my first but, question is, why? Why? Now, several things. One, when we think of the teams that had moved, the first one, of course, uh, the Boston Braves moved to Milwaukee and, um, for the 1953 season. In the year after that, the St. Louis Browns moved to Baltimore and become the Orioles. Now, um, uh, Griffith was very concerned about the neighborhood where Griffith Stadium was located. It was located in an area uh, that he thought was becoming um, run down. Mm-hmm. Now, this is a traditional African-American neighborhood. It is currently where Howard University is in Washington, D.C. A traditional, as I mentioned, uh, a traditional African-American neighborhood. And uh, the attendance in Washington was always poor. Among the worst attended teams um, in, in all of baseball, now, three of those teams were American League teams that were very poorly, had very poor attendance. The Browns, uh, the Philadelphia A's, and the Washington Senators. In part, the attendance was, well, because they were they were poor teams. And when, when uh, the Boston Braves moved to Milwaukee and had, astona- had astonishing success, the poor attendance that the Braves had in Boston, they go to Milwaukee and they're leading the majors in attendance. Wow. Um, Kelly Griffith really um, thought he could do that too. So we began exploring. And of course, Kansas, uh, the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia A's moved to Kansas City um, for the 55 season. And by 58, uh, the two New York teams move out west. And so he's wanting to move. The question is where um, he ultimately decides to move to Minneapolis, St. Paul. There was a stadium constructed about 10 or 15 miles south of Minneapolis, St. Paul in Northfield. But, um, and it was being used as a minor league baseball, um, baseball stadium. And Major League Baseball granted the approval for the, for, uh, well, the Washington Senators to relocate. Now, when they were given, when they were granted approval to re- to relocate, the expansion of baseball was being discussed at the same time, and they were given permission to relocate with the clause that Washington would receive an expansion team in 1961. Huh. So the American League expanded first in 61 and received the two teams and the National League expanded the following year. So the the Senators were allowed to move to the Twins and move to the Twin Cities and become the Twins. 
with the stipulation that Washington would be would receive a new baseball team and they would also be called the Senators. And they didn't last very long. I think it was right around 71 when they right. packed up and moved down to Texas. Right. I hope I I, I hope I explained that yes. in a in a, yes, in absolutely. a clear way. Um, but it is a it's a it's a an interesting situation. Now all of these changes in baseball in nineteen fifties, well we we see that um the rise of the interstate system, uh, the rise of the personal automobile in the 1950s, uh, people moving to the suburbs, the rise of suburbia uh, made it possible for stadiums to be built um, in the outer rings of cities, people moving out of the out of the inner cities, uh, the, the tax base, uh, the, the, the poor infrastructure or, or the gradually dilapidating infrastructure in inner cities. And the same reason that the... the the senators moved were, in many ways, the same reason that the other teams moved in 1950s. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're wanting to go where maybe fans are or where the money is. And and the Braves uh, moved to Milwaukee. You know, it showed that, well, it showed that baseball could thrive in the upper Midwest. Nobody thought it could, but it did. Keep it. Um, and, and of course, at this time, the craziness of this for Washington is that the senators are finally putting together a good team. And you mentioned so many of those names earlier, Oliva, Cott, Versalles, uh, Earl Batty, uh, later on Rod Carew, and of course, Bob Allison. They were putting yep. together one heck of a team. Tell me about that. It is, um, it's, it's fate, I guess. Can you imagine had they stayed two or three more years in Washington with the kinds of players they had. After all, the Twins uh, battled the Yankees in their second season in Minnesota uh, for the pennant and ended up in second place. Right. Now, that would have happened in Washington, of course. Uh, and it doesn't mean that they would have had the attendance, but it does mean that Washington could have had uh, sustained success throughout the 1960s. So you never know. You never know. Right. Now let's 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 go back for a second to uh Harmon Killebrew and Bob Allison. You mentioned earlier that they they developed a really good friendship. Tell me about that, because they did. They really grew to be great friends. Well, they grew to be great friends. Um and as I mentioned, it starts in the in the minor leagues in nineteen fifty six, even though Killebrew had had spent two years on, a, on, on the big league roster in 54 and 55, he's really a beginning baseball player in 1956 because he had no at-bats. His skills had atrophied. Um, Killebrew often talked about his skills atrophying, sitting on the, on, on the wood in the dugout, not doing anything. Hmm. So they really started their careers together in many ways. Um, they were batting third and fourth together, not always, but very often or fourth and fifth, depending on, on the league and depending on the team. Uh, and they were very, they were very close friends. And in Minnesota, they became, as I mentioned, the Mr. Upstairs and Mr. Downstairs, they became very close friends because of what they did in Minnesota together. Mm-hmm. Now, Bob Allison became a very popular figure in, in Minnesota. Um, one of the reasons was he became one of the first big name players on the team uh, to establish full-time residency in Minnesota. So he became um, a fixture in the Twin Cities. He uh, became a fixture in the community. And I think maybe one more thing, um, I can't recall in, the bio, in my bi- biography if I have some quotes, but he was considered to have really uh, movie star looks. He was tall, good-looking. Um, he was affable. He spoke well, and uh, he became a popular player uh, because of all of these things combined. And in, in 1961, um, in the first season uh, of Minnesota, uh, he uh, Bob Allison had slumped his uh, second year um, in 1960, but in uh, 1961 he begins the first of. His first five seasons in Minnesota are all really good seasons. Now, really good seasons, I'm talking about 
he was somebody who you could count on hitting 30, 30 plus home runs, driving in close to 100 RBIs. As I mentioned, these this is an era where there were um, where offensive statistics were were really um, uh, well they were deflated. It was a pitcher's a decade. Bob Allison, in his nine full seasons, finished in the top ten of home runs in eight of those nine seasons. Um, I point that out because I don't want I, that could be a good trivia question because nobody. I would say, but could think of Bob Allison as one of the major home run hitters of the 1960s. And that goes back to this. I've got to ask this question. He, you know, he was such a terrific athlete, a three-time all-star. He was a rookie of the year. How can someone like that, who, who, who hit as many home runs as he did for a team that, by the way, we're going to get there in a second, in 1965, goes ahead and wins the AL pennant. How can this guy be so obscure? How can he be forgotten like he is? Yeah, yeah. well, I think it's a good, uh, a good question. I don't really have an answer other than to say, uh, much like I did in the introduction, when you have a player like Harmon Killebrew, uh, whose power was awe-inspiring, that's the only, that's maybe the best uh, description for it, someone who is uh, hitting home runs, uh, led the decade, the 1960s in home runs, and you can count on him hitting 40 a season, and then with such a talented team of not just all-stars, but of rookie of the years, MVP award winners, uh, a very strong pitching staff. Allison was a vocal team leader, but he won the spotlight. So he's not someone that, that's looking for the attention outside of the dugout and outside of the field. And maybe because of that personality, um, who would you rather interview if you're on um, a, a nationally televised or a nationally broadcast game of the week? Harmon Killebrew? Sure. To introduce, him, to introduce him to New York or to the West Coast or Bob Allison. Right, right. Who would you compare Bob Allison to as far as today's game is concerned? If somebody said, well, geez, who would Bob Allison, who, who, who reminds you of Bob Allison? Can you, can you pick a player or two? I, uh, I mentioned Kyle Schwarber earlier. Yep. Um, I think for his hitting, of course, Schwarber is nowhere. Uh, he's not the kind of defensive outfielder that Bob Allison was, and so that would be that would be unfair to compare the two. But they're big, and Schwarber is faster than he appears to be, and he's developing um, he's developing his uh, in the outfield. But that's still just not a very good comparison. I'd have to think a little bit about who I would compare him to today. Because in today's in today's game, I don't know if you have um, the big, rugged players who are going to be a- as fast as Bob Allison was. I mean, he was really um, a prototypically fast player whose speed is not going to show up in the stolen base category. Mm-hmm. Maybe a player of a generation ago, I would say. Dave Parker. Mm. Uh, Dave Parker was not a um, not a, a prodigious home run hitter, uh, but he had power. He hit for a higher average uh, than Bob Allison did, but they were similar in that um, they were great contact hitters. They were fast, and of course, they had rifle arms in the outfield. Right. Of course, the big year came in 1965, and. That's when this team, this Minnesota Twins team, finally put it all together, and they won the AL pennant with a record of 102 wins and 60 losses, and they finished something like seven games ahead of the Chicago White Sox. How good was that team? And ultimately, they lost to the Dodgers in the World Series in seven games. Well, uh, that team was, uh, it was a great team. It was a great team, and um Players that I've spoken to who played on that team or against that team all echo the same thing. That was an incredibly well-coached team and a team that all worked together. 
Now you mentioned the wins, uh, 102 wins. It was also the end of the Yankee dynasty. Of course, that team had gotten old and, and also the Yankees, of course, did not integrate uh, as quickly as a lot of the successful teams uh, that, of course, diminished their chances. But 1965, uh, a few things that I need to mention. 65, that team who's, uh, the, whose manager is Sam Mealy, um, he has important new coaches on that team. Billy Martin, who, and who played, played for the Twins. Jim Lemon, who had um, played for the team, one of uh, Bob Allison's former teammates with both the Twins and with the Senators. And the picking coach, Johnny Sane. And I, those three coaches, all well-respected. Mm -hmm. What's amazing about this team is I just mentioned, and you've mentioned Harmon Killebrew and Bob Allison. Well, guess what? Those two players were injured almost the entire season. Wow. Bob Allison, in early July, fractures his wrists. He only misses about a week and a half. However, for the second half of the season, has a very difficult time swinging the bat. And has a down season. He hits 23 home runs, which he had bad. He had hit over 30 um, the previous two years and 29 uh, the two years before that. So he had averaged over 30 home runs the, the previous four seasons. And so he was he was very restricted with his uh, starts in left field, and he uh, was beginning to have trouble hitting uh, against. Um, uh, some right-handed hitters or right-handed pitchers. So he uh, was sometimes platoon with a left-handed hitter, a speedster by the name of, of Sandy Valdespino. Hmm. And of course, one month after um, one month after Bob Allison uh, getting injured, what happens? Killebrew is involved in an injury on August 1st. And many think that this is a season injury ending injury for Killebrew. So you have the two most feared sluggers on the team injured. But who picks up the slack? One, Don Mincher comes in and subs for Killebrew at first base. Jimmy Hall um, is in his third or fourth season this time. He hits over 20 home runs. Tony Oliva in his second season, he leads the league and uh, leads the AL in batting again. And Zoilo Versalis, again, one of the most overlooked players of the, of the 1960s, he wins the MVP award. He leads the, the AL with 126 runs and has 19 um, home runs as a middle infielder. Mm -hmm. So the team all came together with a number of players working uh, together to really form a tight knit crew. Um, Johnny Sane. We all know how he really uh, maximized his pitchers. Jim Katz started 42 games and won 18. Mudcat Grant won 21 games. And so they really had a team that all came together, role players as well as stars. But Killebrew had 25 home runs and Allison had 23. Mincher had 22. It was not the big seasons. So ironically, the year the, the Twins win the pennant, that's a down season for both Kilibu and Allison. Huh. Nobody, you would have won. You would have won the lottery had you betted on that. Huh. So, so why was this team unable to sustain its winning ways basically until baseball split into four divisions in 1969? Because they had some really good ball players, as you just said. They won in '65. They didn't win in 66, and then, of course, 67 was the great Red Sox year, and 68 was the great Tigers year, and going back to uh, 66, I think that was the year of the, uh, I think it was the White Sox. Uh, yes, yeah, well, um, they, the, 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 the Twins were up and down, maybe for a number of reasons, and it is an interesting story, um, but could I just mention one thing about the Twins World Series? 100%. Well, uh, the Twins are playing the Dodgers in the World Series. 
Of course, the Dodgers are led by the left-righty combo, Drysdale and Sandy Koufax. Pretty tough to beat them. And, and as we mentioned with with um, with Allison injured, Allison does not start game one against Don Drysdale, okay? He's batting right-handed against the right-handed hitter. Valdespino uh, starts. And the Twins beat uh, Drysdale. In game two against Koufax, Allison starts. They beat Koufax. And I'll just mention this one play because it truly, Warren, is a catch that is among the most, let's say, most well-known, or at least some considered to be one of the best catches in baseball World Series history. In that second, in the second game, in the fifth inning, on on soggy grass, on saw so- uh, uh, wet grass, um, Bob Allison makes an amazing running backhanded catch. Okay, on a ball hit by Jim Lefevre. It is an arcing ball that Allison runs. I don't know how far. Let's say 60, 70, 80 feet. Wow. Slide makes a catch. He the clip is on YouTube. He probably and, and Major League Baseball shows it during the uh, the playoffs and World Series. You know, in the commercials, but he probably slides thirty feet in the soggy grass. <laughs> it is truly an amazing catch. And this is somebody who's injured and he's thirty years old. Now, why did the Twins not repeat in nineteen sixty six? Um, uh, and I, I wouldn't say they didn't sustain their success. Because after all, in, in 1960, um, in 1967, they came in second uh, to Boston. And in 1969, in the first year of divisional baseball, they did win yep. uh, the AL West. And they won but it again, I think, in 70. And they won it again in 1970, exactly. But there have been some interesting stories about that. And my colleagues at Sabre have written about this, and I think, a colleague by the name of Daniel Levitt actually has a very good essay for Sabre about um, the Twins' demise. And maybe you can look at it for a number of things. Um, some say the Twins, the players aged very quickly on the Twins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't mean Killebrew because Killebrew sustained his success. But I do say, well, Allison, um, Allison was injured uh, for a lot of 1966, and he came back in 67 and 68, but he was often replaced defensively at the end of games. But other players really aged quickly. Earl Earl Batty as catcher aged quickly. Rich Rollins at third base aged quickly. Quickly. Jimmy Hall, who had over 30 home runs as a rookie, I believe that was in 60 uh, 63, um, 30 home home, home runs. Um, he aged quickly and was a uh, a part-time player by 1966. Um, Zoilo Versalles really fell off uh, the baseball radar. He aged very quickly. Mudcat Grant, um, a great uh, pitcher and even a greater baseball, even a greater person, community community activist. Um, well, uh, he was only a part-time starter by 1967. Jim mm. Cott continued his success. And so that team, um, they really had a drop-off of that team. Um, you know, that's that's fate as well. Uh, Total aging, uh, some injuries of players. But uh, you mentioned uh, the, the, the impossible dream of 1967. Well, 67, you had the White Sox, Boston, um, Minnesota and the Tigers all vying in that last month of the season. All four teams uh, were in were in um, were in the hunt at last season. Mm-hmm. A lot of good, a lot of good baseball in 1967 uh, with four teams uh, going for the pennant. But there's another maybe story as well, and that is Sam Mealy was um, eventually fired um, in 1967. Uh, and he uh, he was replaced by Kel Ermer, and Kel Ermer also had some problems with the team, um, uh, especially in 1968. They thought that 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 Kel Ermer had lost the team after finishing in second place in '67. Uh, they dipped uh, under 500 in 1968, um, and many thought that Kel Ermer had lost the team. 
And Billy Martin takes over the team in 1969. Of course, he had been on that staff, knew the team very well. And uh, this is Billy Martin's first major league uh, baseball managing opportunity. And so and he, many don't know that he not only did he manage the Twins, he managed the Tigers, he managed the Rangers, and of course, obviously, the Yankees. And some people don't even recognize the fact that he managed the Oakland A's, too. Yeah, well, Billy Martin, he got that team to come together in 1960, uh, in 1969. Keep in mind, he had played with so he had played with a good number of these guys, right? He had he had uh, played with Killebrew. He played with Allison. He knew the stars. He was mm-hmm. uh, a coach with uh, players like Tony Oliva uh, and and Rod and, and Rod Carew uh, in, in '67 when Rod Carew was a rookie. And he got that team together. Uh, they won 98 games. And they won uh, the division. Uh, had a lot of good players. Uh, Jim Perry, he, who was also on the 1965 pennant team, he had that big season, won 24 games, I mm-hmm. believe, somewhere around 24. Um, and uh, that team wins. Now, maybe just a few things about um, Bob Allison. Again, I don't want to forget. Yeah, no, because I want Bob you to Allison. actually talk about Bob's growth as a player, how his game changed from the time he broke in and mm-hmm. until he finally had to hang up his cleats. Well, uh, well, this uh, it's, it's good that we moved ahead uh, to see where where the twins are going, and so we can pick up this story about Bob Allison. Now, Bob Allison, as I mentioned, he had uh, suffered a wrist injury in 1964, uh, actually in '64, again in 1965, and was uh, injured. Uh, had difficult time uh, battling in 1965. He had slumped compared to his previous four seasons. And in 1966, he has his fourth wrist injury in as many years, and he misses well over half the season. Ugh. And he comes back and, and plays in both 67 and 68. Um, by this time, his knees are aching. He's taking some cortisone shots. He's still a feared slugger. Um, he's a player who in many ways today, um, he drew walks. He had power. <laughs> But he's no longer the player that he was. These four wrist injuries and his knee injuries. And he's also 33 at the time, which is old in baseball in the 1960s, mind you. But um, by the time 1969 rolls around, he is a part-time player. He only has around 200 at-bats in 1969. But he is a confidant to Billy Martin. And Billy Martin really thought that uh, that Bob Allison had managing capabilities. Now I'll say this, uh, you know as well as I do, one thing that Billy Martin did not toss around easily, compliments. Nope. And when Billy Martin said that you had major league managing and coaching ability, you must have had it. Now, Allison didn't go into coaching. Martin you mentioned Martin's career after the Twins. Uh, Martin wound up uh, managing a number of teams, one of which was, of course, uh, the Tigers. And in 1971, Billy Martin, that was his first season with the Tigers, uh, Billy Martin tried to get uh, Allison to come to his staff, and he huh. did not do it. Huh. Now, Billy, Martin, Billy Martin called uh, Bob Allison my leader behind the leader on the bench. In other words, the last two seasons for Bob Allison, 1969, played a handful of games. And even in 1970, he only played in uh, maybe 30 or so games. Uh, those last two seasons, he was um, he was basically an, an informal coach on that team. His mm-hmm. last two seasons at age 34 and age 35. Now, I, I, I it would be remiss of me to... Uh, to maybe overlook one of the ugly scenes in Minnesota baseball history and one that precipitated uh, the demise of Billy Martin with the Twins. One might wonder why Billy Martin only managed one season in Minnesota and was fired at the end of the 1969 season. Well, near the end of that season, uh, Billy Martin was involved in a very ugly incident and 
uh, somehow uh, Bob Allison was involved in that as well. Now, the ugly part I'll mention first, and that is that Dave Boswell, the 20-game winner for the Twins, uh, and Billy Martin were in a fight after a game in a bar in Detroit, and Billy Martin wound up beating David uh, Dave Boswell pretty badly, and he, <laughs> Dave Boswell, ended up in the hospital. Ugh. Now, I, wrote, I wrote Dave Boswell's biography, too. There's a lot of that uh, story in there. It's not so much about Bob Allison. Where does Bob Allison come in? Well, it comes in that what precipitated the fight between Boswell and Billy Martin was that Dave Boswell and the pitching coach, Art Fowler, were in the hotel bar, probably having too many, and they got into a fight. Bob Allison was trying to get those two to knock it off, pull them outside. Dave Boswell cold cocks Bob Allison, uh. knocked him out. Uh. And Billy Martin, you know, he was a smaller guy, especially compared to um, uh, Bob Allison, though. Bob Allison was sucker punched. He didn't see the punch coming and he was knocked out cold. Billy Martin flies into a rage. Boswell ends up in the, um, in the emergency room. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the end of his uh, career as, as, as you just went through, um, wasn't, wasn't the great, the greatest. I mean, he, he suffered through injuries, uh, persevered as, as much as he could, but man, the people in Minnesota, they loved him. They loved Bob Allison and, and Bob Allison loved Minnesota. In fact, you wrote that he was actually the first player in Twins history to be honored with his own day, Bob Allison Tribute Day. What yeah. did that mean to him? And talk about the charitable efforts in and around Minnesota that Bob partook in. Well, he was um, very active in the community, as I said. It, it's not something that uh, began uh, at the end of his career, but rather he was very uh, closely tied to the Minneapolis-St. Paul community when he arrived uh, in 1961 with his wife, setting up year-round residence there. Um, he, uh, Allison, uh, retired after the 1970 season. Um, he had begun to work for Coca-Cola uh, during his playing days. But even before that, he was involved in a lot of um, um, goodwill programs in the area, visiting hospitals, working uh, especially with Easter Seals, working with sick children, working with these kinds of uh, community outreach programs. Now, keep in mind, these community outreach programs that young baseball fans today think are an integral part of all baseball teams, 40 and 50 years ago, these were not as common. Do you know what I mean? Yes, I do. Yeah. Nowadays, you have, let's say, the Minnesota Twins charity, the Chicago Cubs charities. We're talking about 50 years ago, and things worked a lot differently. These were efforts that Bob Allison himself undertook. And so when he had his uh, tribute day, an interesting uh it's a cute acronym, the BAT Day, Bat yeah, Day, Bat Day, um, the uh, Bob Allison Tribute Day, was um, in September in 1971, and um, he was, you know, in many ways, um, uh, just a, a beloved figure in uh, in Minnesota. And as I mentioned, um, he became an executive for Coca Cola and was involved uh, in Coca Cola um, uh, for the remaining of his working career. He retired around 1990. Uh, he had worked in different cities as well. But it is a, it's a bit of a sad story. Um, near his time that he retired from Coca-Cola in 1990, must have been somewhere around 55 years old, he developed an incurable disease called ataxia. Um, that uh, This disease, I don't know a whole lot about it, um, but it... Um, it affects brain cells and impairs your coordination. If you think of someone like Bob Allison, or what separated Bob Allison from his peers was, in fact, 
his physical prowess mm-hmm. and the hair of your coordination impaired uh, must have been very de- uh, debilitating. And uh, he, Bob Allison, um, founded the Bob Allison Ataxia Research Center at the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. And this is uh, this is a research center that still today um, exists. It is a leader in ataxia research. And um, they have a website. You can look at that. They have a Twitter. Uh, they tweet. And he died at age 60, um, five years after his, uh, or around five years after the diagnosis, or at least when the diagnosis was made public. Uh, he died in 1995, only 60 years old. Yeah, what a shame. Hey, overall, when we look back at the career of Bob Allison, what should we remember? Well, I think we should remember that um, he was first and foremost a family man who loved his community, who, who was dedicated to team success before individual glory, was willing to change positions to help the team, even though the change of position might have meant less notoriety or less success for himself. And that's what we need in baseball today. Sure. Think of people who are interested in putting up the numbers, um, the personal glory. This is somebody who did everything he could for his team. And maybe, maybe one more thing. This is someone who by all calculations insiders sports writers had no business even being in in the major <laughs> league yet wound up forging a career where he was in the top 10 home run hitters of his league all but one time in his full seasons incredible what a great That's story gregory you are a wealth of knowledge and i am so happy that you 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 agreed to come back on to talk about Bob Allison. Uh, what a what a terrific podcast! We what what a terrific interview! I'm so happy that you came back. Well, it's a it's a lot of fun. I really um one I I love listening to the podcasts. I'll keep, I'll keep tweeting about them for my tweet, which I'll plug. It's the Saber Bio Project. Um, Twitter account. You can follow that. And I'll keep retweeting. I love to listen to them. I love to listen. Also, I've, I've gone back and listened to the previous ones about the non-baseball players. And I really look forward to um, what comes on after the baseball season with um, some hockey and, and football and basketball. I won't be able to help you much there, but <laughs> come the spring, give me a call. You got it. Gregory, thank you so much. Hey, before I let you go, what what's coming up next for you? What are you working on? Well, um, a number of things. I have right now a book for Sabre on Wrigley Field, which is going to the publisher any day now. I hope that that book uh, will be out in spring, let's say maybe March, March or April. Then another book on Comiskey Park. That book is coming out in the summer or late summer. So those are our next two books. And an interesting project that I should mention, since we talked about the Washington Senators, um, as I mentioned, always been fascinated by them. I just launched a new book on Griffith Stadium. Cool. And I hope to have that out in the summer of 2020. There is, um, who knows? Um, maybe a Sabre convention could be in the Washington area. And if that book came out for our annual Sabre convention, that could be an interesting development too. Very cool. Gregory, again, thank you so much. I can't wait to read those books. And yes, next spring, when we get back into baseball, you're top of the list. Okay. I really appreciate it, Warren. You have a good week. I really meant it when I said Gregory is a wealth of knowledge. The guy knows so much about baseball, and I'm so thrilled he was able to join us here on Sports Forgotten Heroes once again. Now, Bob Allison. He hit 255 with 256 home runs, 796 RBI, 84 stolen bases, and he had an OPS of 829. Not too shabby. 
His best years came in 1959, his rookie season, when he clubbed 30 home runs, knocked in 85, and had a batting average of 261. He also had years in which he hit 35 home runs and 32 home runs, had a 105 RBI season and a 102 RBI season. In fact, the four-year stretch of 1961 through 1964, Bob averaged 31 home runs, 96 RBI, and his OPS of 911 led the American League in 1963. But playing in the shadow of Mr. Upstairs, Harmon Killebrew, on teams that also included Tony Oliva, Jim Cott, Rod Carew, Zalio Versales, certainly affected his popularity. Nonetheless, Bob was voted by Twins fans as the team's greatest left fielder over the course of their first 25 years. He certainly enjoyed a wonderful career for Minnesota, and hopefully, with this podcast, his contributions to the success of those teams does a little to elicit the memories and remind baseball fans everywhere of just how great a ball player Bob Allison was. Next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes, something a little different. While many of us have heard of baseball's famous double play combination of Tinker to Evers to Chance, I bet very few know their first names and even fewer can talk about their careers and just how key they were to the Chicago Cubs of the early 1900s, a team that won more games over a five-year stretch than any other team in baseball history. That's next time. Thanks again to today's guest, Gregory H. Wolf, and I'll see you next time on Sports Forgotten Heroes. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football, Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s, Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports, Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.